I'm delighted to be here today to moderate this panel discussion with the senior leaders of four prominent globally recognized asset management firms. Asset management, like almost all industries, has been hugely impacted by advances in technology over the last few decades. For example, it's hard to imagine that less than 20 years ago, we were trading equities in sixteenths of a dollar. What are some of the ways in which technology has most impacted your businesses? And can machines eventually replace humans? Or is there a limit to technology? Eddie, why don't we start with you? Thanks, David. So I'll make two quick points just uh, by way of introduction. The first is that the, the theory that uh, technology in the asset management industry is going to be a, a, a huge job killer, I think is inconsistent both with economic theory and with the evidence. Um, years, generations of uh, macroeconomic theory, labor market theory has kind of predicted that uh, along with job destruction, there is job creation. And that's what we see in the data. I mean, asset management employment is at an all time high. I think it's probably the case for each of the members of the, uh, of the panel. The second point I would make is I would be reluctant to paint a picture of technology as a, an external force that is uh, applied to the asset management industry, a disruptive force. I think um, much of the technology, much of the, uh, the most impactful technology that is brought to bear on the asset management industry uh, is developed by the industry, you know, including some of the firms in this room. Um, the amount of uh, capital stock in the form of technology that complements the human capital in the industry is at, an, is at an all time high. The people get more productive every year, they make more money every year, and the amount of technology support that they have uh, is, is greater every year. Michael, some views on this topic as well? Sure, um, and, and I would say I think that uh, the intertwining of human and machine is, is sort of irreversible at this point. Um, just think about the fact, when's the last time anyone here memorized a phone number? You just don't do it anymore. We're going to take a little different track because we do use technology, obviously, as, as a systematic firm to do investments. But I want to try and marry um, technology to talent. Tell a quick little story. So uh, we had a um, competition called the International Quant Championship, where we had uh, used our web platform to find talent around the world. And sort of like an international math Olympiad, but we ran it ourselves. And um, we started this earlier in the year. And the results were astounding. And this is where you see talent and technology come together, where uh, there was a, uh, a team of three young women in France who wound up winning the competition. And uh, we found them by using this web platform to find them. They competed for six months um, from France and uh, got into the leaderboard. We had 15 different uh, countries represented. It came to Singapore out of about 11,000 entrants in 80 countries around the world. You can't do this without technology. Then they arrived, um, and we found out that actually they were living in France, but they were Russian nationals who had gone to the University of Moscow and then moved to France to get graduate degrees there and then work there. So we have France, we have Russia, now we have Singapore, um, and they came to compete. And then the last twist to this story was one of them couldn't get her visa at the last minute, so only two of the young ladies actually arrived. And they had to work on a problem for an entire day, which was the final problem. And they still were able to work on the problem together, even though one of them was back in France because the technology was global and because they can use WhatsApp video. And all of a sudden, you look and you say that how the world is changing, it's not just using technology to find trading signals or alphas or using it to make investment decisions. It's to find talent, access it, and, and uh, assess it, and then bring it on board. And what could be a better global story of talent and technology than finding you know, three women data scientists from Russia in Paris, bringing them to Singapore for a contest? That's great. Taylor, what about you, man yeah. versus machine? Yeah, so um, I, I think this debate often is in the context of are managers somehow going to be replaced by, that, um, by technology in its own right. For us, uh, predominantly a fundamentally driven uh, equity long-short business, 
We are using it as a leverage point to speed the investment process because idea velocity is becoming so critical these days. Um, and so we have a number of tools that we utilize to help our portfolio managers and our teams speed the pacing in which they're integrating uh, data and information into their investment process. But we also use it for risk taking. And, and I think that that's probably been the most significant shift that was a bit unexpected from traditional fundamental risk takers. Um, so for us, as an example, one of the greatest limitations on driving return is um, portfolio managers who don't scale. And one of the primary drivers of why they don't scale are mental issues. Um, and when I say mental issues, fear of risk, fear of growing too large, and, and um, fear of volatility as a primary. We've tried a lot of different things to influence people. We've yelled at them to take more risk. We've given them fake numbers of capital in hopes that they're still 50% invested on a bigger denominator. Um, we've tried osmosis and, and sitting them next to people like Eddie here and, and who can take bunches of risk. None of that kind of works. So what we actually figured out was <coughs> trading behind them and following them actually effectively works. Um, and so for us, technology is driving returns and it's facilitating that. And at the same token, um, technology is driving greater market efficiencies, whether it's through quantitative strategies or, or the different tools. The resulting impact of that is a narrowing of the focus to really generate unique perspectives. And so whereas three years ago, a portfolio manager or an analyst might have a coverage universe of 100 names, when I contrast that with the data today, a portfolio manager who has 50 names under coverage by each member of their team generates twice the alpha that someone does who has 100 names under management for, for their coverage universe. So different things like that are, are kind of the implications of technology. Um, what I don't see as much as, as the AI fears and machine learning and all the different types of heuristics that assist it um, taking over the industry and changing it dramatically. And Teresa, your firm, uses a more of a true fundamental approach. What are your thoughts on this? Yes, yeah, so I think our, our firm is very different. Uh, Cortica has only about 20 plus companies at any one time, long only, uh, sm uh, small and mid cap in the emerging markets. So that's a very inefficient space. And so the using uh, quant tools for for uh, uh, investing become very difficult. Also, we are long-term investors, we're not traders, and so I think we're kind of on the other end of the spectrum on this whole thing. Um, but obviously, technology is extremely important for us to develop all of the kinds of intelligence we need in a product market to understand how a company will do. Uh, we invest in companies. They also happen to be stocks. We have to make sure they're good companies, and then secondarily, we make sure they're good stocks. But making sure they're good companies, I, I think what we have really uh, learned from our friends in the technology world is how is, the, what, how is their heuristic that they use to pick stocks uh, useful for us? How can we make sure that our learning is, is um, using those approaches, that we are uh, understanding what makes good qual high quality management? So, well, what questions do we need to have answered to understand uh, high quality management versus not high quality management? Uh, what answers do we need for um, understanding uh, uh, how a market will be affected by uh, certain endogenous changes. So we, I think, are always learning from what's going on in the tech world. Great, great. Let's talk a little bit more about the role of data. So I think we would all agree that the era of big data is upon us. Uh, the amount of data in existence continues to increase at an exponential rate, but much of it is extraneous. So how has the explosion of data impacted your businesses? And how do you filter through the noise in order to find data with real predictive power? Michael, why don't we start with you? Um, I think the era of big data for us started about 20 years ago. <laughs> so it's just become um, a little bit more uh, in, the, in the common press. Um, but what we do for a living is filter data. Um, we, have, uh, a, we, we look at data very much now as the competitive advantage is about scale and about finding whatever the yield is. is you may trial 1,000 data sets, and maybe your yield's 25%. So the real challenge for a quantitative shop, for a systematic shop, is to trial as much data as you possibly can. And we have a variety of tools and machine learning techniques to try and assess the value of data um, before we purchase it. But we also, when you look at it from a statistic perspective, we don't have to 
not every data set has to work. Um, sometimes you buy them and they don't work out because you don't really know the value of them until you put your researchers on them for six or nine months and then see if you actually can find value in them. So it's a multi-step process to try and find the initial assessment, the negotiation, um, the buying of the data, and then the true research. And if you think you're going to get every single one right, you're fooling yourself because you just can't. The world is increasing so quickly in the types of data you have out there, you'll make some mistakes, and that's just the cost of doing business in the data world. Okay. Taylor, what about FLESI? Yep. Um, so for us, like, there's two terms that, that drive me crazy. Big data happens to be one of them. I think that was the most overused hedge fund marketing term of 2016. Quantumental is that category in 17. <laughs> um, uh, you know, to the point, um, data has been very central for a long time. Um, and, and if you're at a 20% yield rate, um, you know, world quant is spectacular in their business, uh, that's about three times what we see. Right, so I'd love a 25% yield rate. Um, so I think when, when, when history is kind of written and people reflect a little bit, credit card data is one of those things you see uh, people talk about nonstop in the fundamental business. It's a consumer thing, it's something you can touch. Uh, 260 names, we can accurately predict 52% of the time the revenues, whether they'll meet, beat, or exceed um, by some degree for consumer companies. And we've made oh, a little bit more than zero on that information. Um, and that's because the consumer data uh, is for companies that revenues alone aren't the significant driver of return, right? It, it relates to earnings and forward guidance. Um, so if you could get uh, revenue line data purely for the iPhone and, and, and isolate it, that, that's something that you can monetize from that side. So my point on the, on the data piece is that it's incrementally helpful. In certain cases, credit card data is required to compete. Um, I, I would argue it gives you a very limited advantage for very short periods of time without consistent predictive power. Right? But in, in other cases, um, even thin alphas or, or small signals uh, provide tremendous value as long as you've got good signal quality around it in other places, like fundamental stock pickers, as an example. So for us, data is integrated into the process. It's a much lower yield than people perceive it to be. Uh, the stuff that everyone talks about typically tends to be the least value. Um, I don't know when you've had a conversation with someone that's, that's doing big data on healthcare. Or, or big data on insurance. That's the stuff that's interesting. Mm. Uh, and from that side, that's, that's kind of where you want to focus from my perspective. Teresa, Teresa, what about with a fundamental, long-only, emerging market, concentrated strategy? Are there dangers of relying on data too much and overfitting? Um, I think we're constantly um, relying on macroeconomic data because uh, we choose countries uh, in our process, and uh, there are a lot of dangers of overfitting, um, and that's why you, these you go into countries that are old friends because you know what what's um, uh, important for one country may not be for another, right? For so Brazil is a very closed economy, and that acts very differently than Mexico, which is a very open economy. So you, you have to, I think, be very careful there that you're um, looking at the right data for the right uh, macro situation. Uh, and then on the micro side, we generally aren't going to have big data or very big data. Um, and we have to always be aware that we might have the wrong data. In fact, Bloomberg is often wrong. Yeah. Um, and so it's that we, take, we take months to look at a company because we're always second guessing whether the data is correct or not. Mm -hmm. I'd like to flesh out some thoughts from the panelists here on the buy versus build approach when it comes to systems or, or even data. Um, Eddie, let's start with you. Are, are you more likely to build or buy the tools and data that's utilized in your business? So theoretically, we're agnostic. I mean, uh, it's um, a lot easier to, to buy something and integrate it and not have to spend the, the management time and the staff time on building something to uh, uh, to suit um, if it's available. But, uh, you know, I think for many of the folks on, on the stage and, and many of the folks in, in the audience um, who are at the forefront of their respective fields, sometimes when you're looking for something, it doesn't exist commercially. And so uh, often what we've found over the years is that we've had to build it. Um, as the years have gone on, and as uh, the, the hedge fund industry in particular and asset management generally has achieved scale, you know, some of the, um, 
the technologies that have been kind of built by the buy side uh, have made their way into, uh, into the commercial realm. And so, you know, there are several examples of um, successful kind of third party service providers that uh, started life as, you know, some arm of some hedge fund. You know, in our case, we created a company called Arcesium uh, three years ago to where we spun out uh, our technology team and uh, services team. Thank you. <laughs> um, uh, and, uh, you know, we've made that available to high quality places like Balyasny and many of the other uh, folks uh, in this room. Um, and so uh, sometimes it's great to buy, sometimes it's great to build, and it just depends on whether the thing you're looking for in the, uh, exists in the marketplace. Michael, what about you guys? Yeah, I, I, would, uh, I would agree with uh, Eddie that uh, the, the third party vendor market has really matured over time. If you look 10 years ago, you almost did have to build almost everything yourself. And it really has with spin outs, with actual venture led companies. I, I think we look at it very much, and we have a pretty large technology team, 125 plus, I don't know the numbers exactly right now, but I look at it as, um, we look at it as an opportunity cost. We really want our technology staff, which we uh, place great value in, working on the highest value, highest gain things that we can for the firm, because otherwise it's an opportunity cost lost. I think our CTOs in the office uh, audience would say we're 10 times oversubscribed at any given point, so we have to, we have to pick very, very carefully what we, buy, what we build. We try and buy as much as we can that's not critical uh, to our business. And before we go on, I want to say anything, some one thing about data, um, that, and I agree with Taylor, quantum mental and big data, I hate those words. They drive me nuts for lots of reasons. But big data, data is just data. It's the predictive power and what you do with the data that really matters. So it should be called big prediction or something a little <laughs> bit more thoughtful than big data because that's static thing sitting there. It doesn't do anything for you. Sorry about that. Great. Uh, this week marks the 10 year anniversary of a crisis on Wall Street that roiled financial markets and rocked the world. Many people believe that artificial intelligence and automation are having a transformative impact on how asset managers are navigating risk and opportunity. What are some of the ways in which your firms are utilizing technology to be better prepared for crises and market stresses? Uh, Taylor, why don't we hear Sure. That? Um, so for us, what I would characterize again, it's a common theme you'll hear me talk about today. Technology, we are deploying to leverage things in a more expedient fashion. Um, and more breadth of analysis. So from risk, uh, a lot of visualization tools we have created uh, to better spot risk. We're used to just look at data charts and things like that. There's now different ways to array it that um, get you focused much, much faster. There's a, a, quite a lot more attribution that you can analyze. Um, but when you come down to the question of what's going to matter in the next crisis, for us, uh, I, I, I've always, in, in, and I've been head of risk for the firm for a long, long time until recently, but. Um, what I characterize, it's a fool's errand to try and figure out what the next crisis looks like. So what you need to do is, is have a breadth of potential scenarios that come out. And, and where we leverage technology, um, and in, importantly, the digitization of liquidity information and market depth, and bring those together in a way that we never could. Uh, and so what that helps us do is game plan for the next crisis. Um, it doesn't improve our odds of predicting the crisis. Great. And Michael? Uh, and Taylor and I were trying to figure out ways we could disagree to make it more interesting, but I have to agree with you <laughs> on this one as well, which is the only assurance of the next crisis is that it won't be anything like the prior crisis, so you just can't predict it. But what you can do is be ready to simulate it and react, and that means you need to have all of your information, you need to be able to simulate, and then from our perspective, I mean, we do this for a living, we simulate, and, and with the advances in technology, we can just do more and more of it and cover more of the infinite space of what could possibly happen. And when you see it start to happen, then you can start to see how you'll react and, and, and sort of react accordingly. So I think it's more preparedness to be reacting um, than in any kind of way trying to predict the next black swan. Um, and just from our perspective, I, I was looking at the numbers the other day and I think we've just now passed 500 billion simulations since we started counting. Um, how much we actually simulate to different uh, securities and, and situations. So it really is being able to be reactive, not predictive on that front. Staggering number. Just one thing on that. Um, it's interesting to consider how uh, technology can help you manage different types of risk. I mean, one, you were citing the uh, financial crisis of 10 years ago, and I can recall uh, 
you know, various European countries passing uh, short still restrictions in the middle of the night and having to, you know, make technology enhancements literally overnight in order to prepare yourself uh, for trading the next day and avoid, uh, you know, trading something that you weren't permitted to trade. But the, um, the application of technology to other forms of risk, you know, uh, non-capital markets risks, uh, is exploding as well. Um, you know, many of the, three of the four firms on this uh, dais um, are fairly large organizations that um, uh, have a risk function that is managing the activities of uh, large numbers of staff. And so technology can help uh, detect uh, changes in, in, in trader behavior, trade in, uh, in the actual trades that are put on, uh, changes in communication patterns, you know, uh, uh, taking a look not at the individual um, words that your uh, individual staff uh, say in their emails or, or texts, but monitoring in the aggregate uh, for changes in behavior. Um, so there are lots of different types of risks that uh, the technology can be brought to bear to help you manage. To Eddie's point, there are companies out there that say, you may have used them, we haven't yet, but say they can predict with a high degree of accuracy who's going to resign in the next three months by looking at email traffic. Yeah. Not the content so much as number. the cadence, the number, and the sort of networking effect of where emails go. LinkedIn pings. You know, things. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Again, predictive versus just the data. We have the data. If you can't predict on it, it doesn't help you. We've talked a bit about the impact of technology on the investment function, also on the risk function. Uh, but technology also has a huge impact on the operations of asset management firms. And despite some of the advancements in technology, uh, there's still a large part of our industry that operates via paper, fax, and email to settle and reconcile transactions. I'd like to hear some views from the panelists on the impact of technology improving asset management operations. And if you like, also comment on things like blockchain. You know, and are those things that are helping you better manage the operations of your business? Um, and, and do you have any views on whether those, uh, something like blockchain is actually investable from an institutional perspective? Michael, you want to start? Uh, sure. There's, there's several questions in there. First, if there's any compliance people in the room from our firm, we don't do any orders on paper or fax or anything like that anymore. <laughs> Just to make sure that we don't Tell get us. that confused. Exactly. I think that, um, let's take blockchain for a second, um, because it's, it is one of those big overused words these days and been very popularized, popularized in, in the press. You know, taking away from a Milk and Dialogues uh, event I went to not that long ago in August, um, blockchain is really a, a breakthrough technology, but for the common person, when it actually does impact our industry, it will be in forms of infrastructure that you don't really know that's what's behind it, right? It'll be the actual output, not the technology behind it. It's been, it's been sort of uh, popularized because of the cryptocurrency thing, which is the sexy output of what blockchain can do, but it can do so much more, and that will really transform, I think, our industry in very quiet ways, like when railroads were laid across the U.S., the railroad... The railroad the engine itself was the sexy thing, but the track was what really was the innovation. Um, so I, I, I see blockchain like that. Um, if we switch to investable, we have a ventures arm. Um, I think, uh, paraphrasing our ventures guys who uh, look at a lot of this, it's so early to tell who's actually going to win. So the really only strategy that we can see these days is if you're going to invest in the area in terms of companies doing this, it's diversification. Very hard to predict winners right now. Um, and I'll leave actually investing in cryptocurrencies for someone else to cover. Okay. Eddie, your thoughts on this one? You know, Teresa made a point early on uh, where, you know, her, describing her uh, investment strategy as being very um, bottom up and fundamental uh, and having a 20 company portfolio and using some of the techniques developed in the quantitative investing industry to uh, uh, develop um, processes and kind of codify. Uh, what she believes uh, is uh, repeatable in her investment strategy. And I think that that concept, e taking um, non-technology processes and turning them into routine things that are repeatable, I think that general principle applies broadly throughout the asset management industry. Um, it's true with respect to managing personnel. You know, if, um, you know, the... Uh, the, the, the act of providing feedback, which is, you know, such a 
it's got to be up there with crypto and big data. <laughs> it's like overused. Yeah, yeah. Feedback's got to be on the list of overused <laughs> words. Um, but you know, in, if uh, you are managing a workforce primarily comp comprising uh, millennials who are craving feedback at every moment, um, you know, it's interesting to consider how consistent you are at scratching that itch and uh, performing that function. To what extent do you know uh, whether your various managers throughout your organization are doing that and doing it well? I think it was Michael who, on the way into the room, was talking about the, the survey-oriented culture of our hosts uh, for the conference, WorldQuant. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, I would say an example of an operational process where technology can be, bring, can be brought to bear uh, is kind of the HR, the, the personnel management uh, portion of, uh, of a firm. Yeah, despite all of these advancements in technology, I think many of us would still argue that the human resources are the most valuable asset within our firms. It's kind of annoying, yeah. but it's true. So, <laughs> Taylor, when, when, when we talked in advance of today, you had some thoughts on this. Yeah, I think, um, let me finish one piece on that technology and then I'll jump. So the, the other piece that we deploy technology for um, is, it, it's kind of a very basic thing, but short, uh, we do short positions on the equity side. Each bank prices them differently. We actually leverage technology to go to the cheapest provider and it's provided tens of millions of dollars that drop to the bottom line of return for our investors. Um, so there's a number of very applicable methodologies that technology helps drive that. Um, rotating to the workforce question, I, I, I think the, the part that uh, has evolved a bit, so we've been in business a bit under 20 years at this stage, um, and no, I didn't really have hair back when we started either, so it's not an evolutionary thing from my side. But what I, what I would say is um, you're now dealing with a work uh, force population that grew up where universities spend a lot on physical plant um, and the surroundings uh, of the classroom and, and creativity and things like that. Um, and so as a result, we've had to adjust to that. And um, one of the things that we did is uh, after years of uh, one of the founders pushing us uh, to put a gym in our organization, we put one in Chicago. Um, and I was shocked by the amount of usage that it got. And we ended up uh, putting, it, putting gyms in across all six of our offices globally. Um, and it has had an amazing effect, both on the creativity of the organization, but probably even tangible things that were, were surprising to me. The basic wellness of the organization um, has improved. And in fact, just a simple data point, sodas, Cokes, and Pepsis, and things like that. Consumption over the last half decade is down 92% across our firm. Now, Red Bull is on the uptick. <laughs> um, but, but what I would say is um, in attracting labor uh, and, and uh, really, at the end of the day, all we are are people, right? Like we could have the world's greatest systems. That's not going to make or break our investing and things like that. It, it, it's, the, it's bringing people together and creating that type of environment. So wellness is one of those areas that has been a real differentiator for us, um, much more so than the ping pong tables or other things like that that can yeah. drive it. Approximately a third of the people working in our industry today were not working in it prior to the global financial crisis. So that's a, an interesting data point right there. And uh, managing human capital has also changed immensely over that, de that last decade. Teresa, what are some of the ways in which you've seen things change with the current generation of professionals? Um. Yes, yeah, so uh, I think that uh, I hear a lot of the law firms in Washington, I live in Washington, everyone's a lawyer, and they're con forever complaining about the millennials, that they enter and they then want to only work on the coolest deals and they want to be the partner right away. I have to say that I haven't seen that, uh, that uh, we hire investment professionals who expect that they are going to do you know, they're two to three years in investment banking or private equity and then come into the buy side uh, and then uh, really love what they do for numbers of years. So I don't know that I've seen um, personally so much of the switch, but certainly uh, lots, of, lots of people have. Um, what I, I do think is important is that we have seen in our investment universe, millennials are very important for uh, the companies we're looking at in terms of their, their um, 
uh, universe. Uh, India's 30% of the population is millennials, and they control 70% of household income. We don't have that kind of skewing in the US. So um, I, I don't know. I mean, we could talk about other elements of it, but for me, I'm not seeing that in our shop. Michael, what about? So uh, interestingly enough, the millennials are millennials everywhere around the world. We're in uh, uh, 16, soon to be 17 countries, and our, our median workforce is in the mid-20s. So we have a lot of really young people, and predominantly they're millennials. And um, we really have to focus on a culture and a, uh, a way to make them feel that what they do every day they find satisfaction in. They come to work and they find a good collaborative environment that's really important. So it, it becomes all of the softer things, like the gym, like the ping pong table, like snacks. Snacks are one of our biggest challenges to get right in every office, given the multicultural aspect of what we have. Um, it's really important to people. And then there's compensation. And quite frankly, I think 20 years ago, or maybe 30 years ago, when some of us you know, entered the industry, you put your head down, you work, you got paid, and maybe you drank water sometimes. Um, the, the world has completely changed. And what these folks want to do is be part of something. And that's really important for us to make that something material and valuable so when they come to work every day, they have that sense of belonging. And that's the soft stuff, and that's where HR has to come in. Mm -hmm. and, and human capital development is critical. Yeah. Can I just make a comment on that? Um, I, LP actually helped me very much. And he said, why do your people come to work? And I said, well, to create better returns for our shareholders. He said, no. Read this 15-year-old article from a Harvard Business Review. And I read it, and it was apparent to me, they come to, business, to work every day in order to learn new things every day, because of course that's what we do, and it's fascinating and fabulous. Secondly, to make companies better, because that's essentially what we're trying to do, is make companies better in the world. And thirdly, because that's how you make returns for shareholders. But to put that in that way, uh, probably about seven years ago, I learned to talk to them that way. So I talked to my staff, I said, what did you learn today? How did you make companies better? And they love it, and they want to tell you what they learned that day, and they want to tell you how they made companies better. And I think that is part of um, people wanting a mission. Uh, and we're all, I think, Part of you know, in being a governance fund, I think that helps us because it's kind of our mission is built into what we do, uh, and that's the way we, we make money through our mission. So I, I do think that that is important. I wouldn't say it's just millennials; it's millennials plus. Yeah, and Teresa, I know you've done some research on how culture impacts financial performance for yeah. looking at the companies you invest in. But are, are there observations that you have from that that you've also applied to? trying to, to foster and build the, the culture of your own firm? Yes, indeed. So I've tried to read all of the academic research there is on the effect of corporate culture on financial performance. And there's not enough, uh, but I've read what there is. And I'm uh, a guy at Harvard Business School is doing a whole bibliography, so I'll have more to read in a month or two when he finishes. Um, and uh, yeah, unfortunately, uh, one of the main things, it's not a big surprise to anyone in this room, uh, is one of the most important things is that the CEO uh, is very clear about the values and lives those values and communicates them all the way down, and that the board supports the CEO in that. And being the CEO <laughs> means that I have to do that, and hopefully I do. Uh, and I hope to, that I'm modeling those, those values. Um, and uh, for us, being in a risk-taking organization, one of the very first uh, values is honesty, because the lowest level person is the one who's going to find the facts out that might mean that an investment has a red flag. right? So we've got to be super honest. In a risk-taking business, you want no incentives for people ever to tell you what you want to hear. Uh, so that's one. Humility is also very big. We, uh, you're, making you're making decisions on complete data. We're making <laughs> uh, decisions on the basis of incomplete information because we can only have what the companies tell us. Uh, and so you have to be humble, 
um, or else I think you don't learn. And then uh, you, we also need to be uh, generous, cooperative. Uh, we use those two words together um, because we actually move portfolio companies' responsibilities around, uh, and and uh, credit uh, gets shared. Okay, great. Managing diversity is incredibly important as we're managing global operations. Eddie, I'd like to hear some of your thoughts around the value of embracing cultural differences and having diversity of talent at your firm. Michael was talking about the demography of WorldQuant's workforce being in a variety of countries. And uh, I think he earlier said that the majority of the staff there is in Southeast Asia, and it's a fairly young workforce. For us, we're about 1,300 people around the world. The majority of our staff is also in Asia. We also have a, a young workforce. And linking this to culture, the challenge of leading an organization and forging a culture that uh, is seeking truth, seeking common goals, um, but coming from very different backgrounds, different national origin backgrounds, different language backgrounds, different educational backgrounds, uh, socioeconomic backgrounds, diversity in, in all its measure uh, is a considerable one. So how do you do that? Um, the first is you make sure that you, uh, as a leadership team, you reflect that. I mean, it's, uh, Teresa is in uh, a member of a minority of uh, significant investment firms that are uh, led by women. I had the privilege to work for much of my career for one of the leading women in the hedge fund industry. Um, and so whether it's gender diversity, socioeconomic, uh, educational background, both for culture and for investment performance, we are all engaged in trying to find mispricings in global securities markets. It's hugely challenging. It's hugely competitive. The firms that are able to combine great minds but also differently great minds are the ones that will, will succeed. There's plenty of academic uh, support for the notion that diverse teams perform better. And uh, the challenge is making that a reality in the workforce. Taylor, you have some views on this? Yeah, well? you know, I think um, we don't have the global footprint where the majority of our staff is, is based outside the U.S. We're predominantly U.S. Um, but, uh, you know, Typically, our organization, when I benchmark us relative to peers, we have four or five times the amount of women in our business um, that other financial firms do. Um, not enough in portfolio manager roles, better at, at the analyst side of things, and then sort of the traditional engagement uh, capacities are there. But I think probably the, the biggest altering we started to do was when we started the business 20 years ago, we didn't have maternity leave of any sort women or, or men um, from that side. Now, there's a, a lot of evolution that we've gotten smarter about it, <clears throat> um, and it is predominantly to, to take advantage of what Eddie's talking about, which is <clears throat> the diverse voices, whether it's gender-based, whether it's race-based, whether it's geographically-based, is clearly valuable. And so you have to put the constructs within the organization uh, to support those different cultures and, and the different focus, and that's been a, 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 probably a pretty significant evolution from us over the years. Okay. And David, let me let me pick up on on what Taylor said. I think because cultural diversity we live with every day. It's how we're how we're uh, set up, and you have to have ways to understand different cultures and recognize that the differences can be pretty big in some cases. Gender diversity as a systematic quantitative um, firm, that's difficult for us. It's hard. We can sort of do as well as what's coming out of university. It is a it is a long challenge for us, and we're trying very hard into the research and portfolio management areas to find more ways to attract. Uh, qualified women. But I'll, I'll give you one story that you start to see that it's not just it's not just what you're doing, but it's how you represent opportunities. So back to our web platform, I was speaking with one, one of our um, team members from our Moscow office, and they onboard a lot of our consultants. The part-time ones are, are in Russia. And she said, well, today I had, well, yesterday, last week, I had uh, an interesting one. I had a grandmother. She was 55. She had qualified, and since she was local, she came in with her granddaughter to sign all the paperwork and become a consultant. And she said, I can do this and make money doing it, but still take care of my granddaughter because my daughter works. 
And those are the kinds of ways you need to change what you do. It's not just the opportunity, it's how you present the opportunity to a much wider and diverse population where otherwise they just can't work full time, for example. Mm -hmm. And if you can create those niches of opportunity, I think your, your uh, set of people that are qualified to do um, what you need them to do really grows almost exponentially around the world. Mm -hmm. And Teresa, as a founder and leader of your firm, you're helping to blaze the trail in this space. <laughs> Can you share your perspective? Um, yeah, uh, you know, I, I don't um, feel that I'm doing anything different because I'm a woman owner of, of an asset management firm or that my, I have two partners, one's a woman and one's a man. Uh, they, my partner simply, my female partner is simply the smartest person I've ever met. Uh, and my male partner is a fabulous partner, and he's really skilled at the parts of the business that we didn't know about. So it, uh, you know, it all kind of worked. I don't, I don't feel myself as you know specifically any different. Um, but um, I do think there is a little bit of an advantage in being a woman who is traipsing around the world, meeting lots and lots of companies, and building a relationship with those companies, and trying to persuade them to doing, do something that will enhance the value. Um, and one of that is just that I'm more unusual. Right? There are tons of, of guys in suits that they see all the time, and so you kind of stand out if you're, if you're just not one of those. Um, so I think that there's, we have some advantages. Um, uh, what I think is a little harder for us um, it isn't being woman managed, it's that the longer our team works together, the more they start to think alike. And so we always have to keep um, uh, you know, throwing in a new person, we have a rotation among our junior analysts who are three years and out, so that you mix it up. So I would say my, our challenge is we're great on all the checkbox diversity. Uh, people come in with quite diverse views. We don't have anything uh, in our system that um, tell, uh, will encourage people to tell us what we want to hear. And in fact, one of the few people we fired it was because he was telling us what we wanted to hear. Um, but on the other hand, the longer they work together, uh, you get more efficiencies, but you also get a little more groupthink. And so I think that's one of the things that we are, we are very aware of and trying to mess it, mix it up. Yeah. Good. So we build on yeah. one thing. I mean, something that is common uh, between what Teresa said and what Michael said is, is diversity is relative, whether you, it's being a... Uh, uh, a female investment uh, manager uh, interacting with a CEO or, um, uh, you know, within the, the quantitative uh, academic community, uh, the, the gender imbalances that exist there. Diversity is relative by definition. And so what um, constantly blows me away, you know, when speaking with uh, members of our staff is their different reactions to different conceptions of, of diversity. When we're talking to the quants, it is unheard of for them to think of diversity as, uh, as being driven by national origin because they grew up in China or they grew up in Eastern Europe or they grew up in India, uh, almost anywhere except for uh, the United States. Um, and for them, hiring somebody with a finance background is like a radical notion, you know, hiring somebody who didn't come from a quantitative uh, field, whereas uh, you know, in our more fundamentally oriented strategies, equity activism or something, you know, there the backgrounds are more the MBA types and uh, for them hiring somebody with a quantitative background would be radical. We talked a bit about the buy versus build aspect of technology, but the point is also relevant when it comes to human capital. Um, I'd like to hear a little bit of the thoughts from the panelists on your philosophy on staffing and development. and whether you guys are more likely to hire experts or to train people to, to develop that expertise. And then also, does this tie in any way into your views on succession planning? Taylor? Yeah, um, so let me start with succession planning. Um, for investment firms, I don't believe in it. Um, I, like when I talk about hedge funds, because I don't actually uh, believe that it's a transferable skill necessarily. So I think that it really depends on the senior roles within the organization, but as you gravitate away from the founders, lots of things shift. 
um, from what I've observed uh, from that side. But separately from that, building a sustainable organization, we've come at it a couple of different ways. I don't think there is one answer to this. So I don't think there is the answer, do you buy talent or do you grow talent? I think you have to do both. Um, and part of that is because you want to rely on proven expertise that you can deploy and generate returns from. Um, the challenge with that is as if you have too large a mix of folks that you, you have brought in at a senior level, they typically will trade away at some stage because they're easy to dislodge because they're open to the next best deal. Right? And so what you have to mix is this idea of how much uh, internally developed folks that you bring from junior analyst to analyst to senior analyst to carve out to PM, have a clear uh, trajectory of a career path and things like that. Um, historically, I would argue we've overemphasized the bringing expertise in. Um, now our big focus uh, for the last couple of years, um, but particularly 18, 19, and 20, is going to be on that path to bring folks up in kind of what I'll call like the farm team, to use a basic sports analogy, and have that as a much higher percentage of the overall firm versus looking to the outside. Michael, does it differ much in a purely quantitative? I, I think that, uh, I agree with Taylor, as usual, um, that you have to do both. But given what we do, we, our entire fabric is really find great talents with predominantly no financial experience whatsoever and train them. Uh, and that's what we do for a living. We, we find quantitative talents, just pure smarts, and then we train them. And then that actually follows through the rest of the organization and the vast majority of our portfolio managers are graduated researchers. So the talent pipeline is very much focused on a farm team approach. We do intersperse um, uh, more experienced hires where we find areas that we don't yet have the experience. And, and one of the things we like to say is don't confuse intelligence or smarts with experience. Experience just takes time. And sometimes you do need to buy it uh, to, to help train up the rest of your resources so they don't go down all of the blind alleys that you would know not to go down if you had the experience, but predominantly we are a farm team, build it in-house from a people development perspective, just find the very best talents regardless of their experience and train them up. Okay. Managing human capital also is incredibly important when it comes to determining capacity in asset management. Eddie, I'd like to hear some of your thoughts on how your firm thinks about that. On managing capacity? Yeah, how, capacity, how human capital is, is a, uh, has a, plays a significant role in determining the capacity of the firm. Like Michael and Taylor, um, we are primarily a place, they called it farm teams, we're farmers too. You know, we hire a little over 100 people a year. I would say 80 plus percent of those people are straight from school and trained up. Um, and uh, for many of the same reasons they articulated. Um, but there is that additional, you know, 15% or so uh, of experienced folks. And I would say um, while the vast majority of the R&D that we conduct is um, embedded within our existing business units, you know, the people who already have uh, expertise in a certain area, they're at the forefront of what they do, they are the most likely people to uh, push that forefront further. Uh, uh, they're, they have the, most in, the best intuition and the best odds of uh, building on successes. But from time to time, uh, the R&D process uh, identifies some area of adjacency, some area of additional opportunity that uh, we have context for, but not as much expertise as we want to have uh, in order to uh, pursue that opportunity. And in those cases, I think it is helpful uh, to uh, augment your capacity building um, approach by uh, using the secondary labor market, you know, bringing on people. We did this, uh, issued a press release a couple of weeks ago uh, in the machine learning space uh, for um, uh, somebody that we brought in uh, at the partner level to head up a, uh, a research unit who comes from academia. That's very unusual for us, uh, whether it's discretionary uh, trading or quantitatively oriented trading. It's usually uh, hiring that we do uh, right out of school, but I think uh, um, there are exceptions to that. And Taylor, you guys follow yep. the platform approach? What yeah, 
you know, so our, the, my take on capacity is a little bit different. Like, there's always a question of how much money can you manage, what's the right ceiling, and um, th that is a fairly complicated uh, process because it, 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 to me it's very nonlinear. It evolves quite a bit. But the last several years, I think the part that's most important and, and the most significant takeaway, if I wanted to create $2 billion of alpha generation, the number of people that are required to generate that $2 billion has increased. And that um, is probably the most significant capacity implication for us. So we couldn't keep the investment staff loads equivalent uh, and still try and generate the same amount of dollars that we did the prior year. We need more people, and that speaks to specialization, the narrowing of coverage universes. Um, as markets become more and more efficient to, gener or, or to define unique perspectives and, and monetize those, just requires more people. So for us, capacity in the way that, that we've been very focused on it is actually increasing the capacity to almost run in place in terms of your alpha generation capabilities. Um, and, and so it's a different perspective than just throwing bodies to, to, to grow capacity. For us, it's, there's, there's an element of standing still that requires more energy into the same spaces. Okay. Asia is incredibly important to each of your firms. Um, what are some of the challenges and opportunities that you guys face with respect to talent management in Asia? Um, and are there any human capital arbitrage opportunities that exist? Um, Eddie, why don't we start with you? Um, hard to generalize. I think uh, what we observe in India is very different from what we observe in China. Uh, and I imagine uh, several people uh, in the audience can um, expand on that general point, including Michael. Um, what I would say is, um, I mean, one observation is that uh, in any high growth environment, Asia included, um, the rate of advance of human capital is very steep, steeper than is the case on average. Um, but asset prices have uh, also appreciated dramatically. And so if you look at the growth rates of uh, compensation relative to growth rates in human capital, those are not uniform across country. And there are instances in which the, um, uh, the person who is in a particular position um, is uh, not equally skilled in different countries. Does that give rise to arbitrage opportunities? Possibly, but usually it's that in some places, it, it's hard to short it. Um, and so I think it's more the case that in some markets uh, for some types of skill, uh, sometimes you need to say this person isn't quite, th what exists in the labor market is not quite uh, commensurate with the requirements of the role. And you have to be willing to just not pursue an opportunity in those instances. It's better to, to walk away than to, uh, uh, to get yourself into a situation that is uh, less appropriate. In other areas, uh, opportunities abound, and that's why you know, we employ hundreds of people. Okay. Yeah, so, so one thing that I've observed, um, you know, Asia for us has probably tripled in size almost every single year for the last five. Um, but they're one, the, the, the subtleties of communication are actually very important, particularly with a distributed organization where uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm resident in, or physically in the United States quite a bit. Um, what I've found with uh, folks that work for us uh, based in Asia, they're quite, it's often confused with being polite, but they're a little bit less direct around their dissatisfaction around issues. <clears throat> and so you, you need a bit more skill in communication to understand where <clears throat> some of my colleagues might walk away and say, oh, everything's perfect with that person. They're very happy. I walk away with, wow, they are really angry, <laughs> right, and really frustrated right now. <clears throat> um, so that subtlety uh, does cut across multiple regions from my perspective. And, and, and it, you can't pick that up on email. You, you have to physically be in the same region to sort that out. So that's one of the cultural subtleties that, that we've been very focused on improving. And Michael, I know you've had some observations through the recruitment and retention of some of your 
Asian talent. Can you yeah. share that with us? So what, one, yeah, one good anecdote that uh, we learn about cultural diversity of our firm, and as we do things to, to increase the World Quant brand, you wonder, well, how much value does it have? And we, we had a conversation, I remember when I joined quite some time ago, where we, were, we found that dissatisfaction with some of our Asian uh, younger uh, quantitative researchers, because it's very important in Asia, not so much in, in the West, but in Asia that your parents and your grandparents are proud of what you do. And I think that'll resonate here much more than it does back home. So knowing that if you're working at WorldQuant, your parents are proud, means we had to brand the company in these, in these countries to be able to allow our employees to go home and make their, make their parents and their grandparents and their family proud by working at WorldQuant. And that was something that we took to heart because it really matters to uh, the Asian cultures. And it matters less than, the, you don't think about that in the West as much, but it matters. And it's something that you have to take into account. We did a lot of work on that to make sure that they could feel proud telling their parents where they work. Okay. And that concludes our panel. So I'd like to thank my fellow panelists and thank you audience. <laughs>